It probably began when China, working with Russia, talked about placing an automated nuclear power system on the moon by around 2035. The public reason is to power the International Lunar Research Station and support long-term activity on the lunar surface. But the announcement also carried a warning. Whoever controls steady energy of Earth controls what can be built, what can run, and how fast a lunar foothold can grow. So the US reaction was swift. If China wants a nuclear unit on the moon by 2035, America wants one earlier, closer to 2030. Under the Artemis push for a lasting presence, NASA has been aiming for a compact fission reactor in the 100 kilowatt class. On Earth, 100 kilowatts is modest. On the moon, it is a backbone. It can keep habitats warm, run life support, power communications, recycle water, and drive the tools that let crews build and repair. It is the difference between we visited and we can stay. But before we get swept up in the race, we should ask a basic question. Why nuclear power at all? Why not solar power, which already works in orbit and powers the International Space Station? Because the moon is brutal for solar in a simple way. A lunar day is about two Earth weeks of sunlight, followed by about two Earth weeks of darkness. During that long night, temperatures can plunge toward minus 200 degrees Fahrenheit. Solar panels do nothing in the darkness. Batteries can cover the gap, but deep cold hurts battery performance and forces you to spend power just to keep the batteries warm. As your base grows, you need more storage, more heaters, more wiring, more spare parts, and more risk packed into the same harsh environment. A fission reactor avoids that trap it runs day and night. It supplies steady power during the two-week lunar night and keeps going for years. With the right design, it can operate for about a decade with minimal maintenance. That constant flow of electricity also makes everything else easier. Life support stays stable. Heating stays stable. Systems do not have to cycle hard, which helps hardware last longer. Nuclear power also wins the logistics battle Fuel is very energy dense. A reactor meant to run for years may only need a few kilograms of enriched uranium-235. That is tiny cargo for a ship that can deliver tens of tons. Solar looks simple until you scale it. To power a settlement with solar, you need large panel fields, strong supports, power electronics, and then huge energy storage to survive the long nights. You also need backup options when dust covers panels, or when a cable fails. The bigger you get, the more hardware you must ship. That is why a tempting idea shows up a lot. Why not use a whole starship as a modular nuclear reactor? Land the ship, hook it up, and you have power. Need more power later? Land another ship. It sounds clever because it uses a vehicle you already plan to send, but it does not hold up. Starship is huge, around 9 meters wide, and over 50 meters tall when stacked and fueled. Its empty mass is often described in the 100-ton range. NASA's lunar reactor goal is the opposite. It is meant to be compact, roughly a few tons, and sized to fit in a cargo bay. Turning a starship into a reactor platform would waste most of the mass and volume on a structure that does not generate power. You would be shipping tanks and metal skin instead of power hardware. Then there is radiation safety. Starships are not designed to shield against radiation. A thin metal hull is not enough. A working reactor needs shielding, careful placement, and a way to keep people away from the source. If you tried to operate a reactor inside a starship, you would still need heavy shielding, extra cooling systems, and long cables so the reactor sits far from the habitat. Add abrasive lunar dust, constant temperature swings, and vibration and the simple plan becomes complicated fast. That is why NASA's approach makes more sense. Build small reactors designed for the lunar surface. Place them away from crew areas. If needed, bury them under lunar soil for added shielding and stability. Use Starship as the delivery truck, not the power plant. As the base grows, deliver several small reactors over time. Each unit can be deployed and managed alone. If one unit goes down, the others keep running. 
This is the kind of redundancy you want in a hostile environment. NASA is not starting from zero. The agency has worked on compact reactor ideas for decades, with a focus on safety, simplicity, and reliability. One of the most famous examples is the Kilo Power Project, built around small fission systems for the Moon and Mars. In 2018, NASA completed a major ground demonstration called Krusty, which showed a small reactor could start up and run steadily in a space-like test environment. Designs like this use uranium fuel and heat pipes to move heat without complex pumps, which helps keep the system simple and rugged. For the Moon, the near-term goal has often been framed as tens of kilowatts scaling toward about 100 kilowatts, with a design life of around 10 years and minimal maintenance. Companies like Lockheed Martin and Westinghouse have been tied to this area. A single unit can support early habitats and equipment. Multiple units can scale a base step by step, pushing power toward the next stage of human presence. Now, about China and Russia. When they say nuclear power plant, what are they actually building? Many experts doubt it means a classic Earth-style plant. Traditional reactors often need large amounts of water for cooling and steam generation. Shipping tons of water from Earth would be extremely expensive. Managing water in a vacuum and extreme cold is difficult. Heat rejection is another major obstacle. A large reactor produces a lot of waste heat. On the Moon, you must radiate that heat into space. That can mean large radiators, careful control, and complex engineering. There is one counter-argument people raise. Lunar ice near the South Pole. If ice can be mined and melted, local water could help with cooling. But that creates a new dependency. Your reactor plan now depends on mining equipment, processing systems, storage tanks, pipes, and maintenance. That is a lot to ask from early lunar infrastructure. So it is possible the phrase power plant is more political than technical. It might describe something smaller, a contained nuclear power unit. And the most common small nuclear unit used in space is the RTG. RTGs, or radioisotope thermoelectric generators, are often called nuclear batteries. They do not run a chain reaction. They use heat from radioactive decay and convert part of that heat into electricity. They do not provide large power, often only tens of watts, but they have a key advantage. They can run continuously for decades, day and night, with no moving parts and very little maintenance. That is why RTGs have powered deep space missions like Voyager and Cassini, and why they have been used on Mars. The United States has long experience with radioisotope power. Curiosity and Perseverance, the two major US rovers on Mars, rely on this kind of system. NASA has used RTG-style power for decades, going back to early space missions in the 1960s. Russia also has a deep history here, including a large production of RTGs in the Soviet era, and experience with compact space reactors. The Topaz reactor family is often cited as an example of a relatively lightweight system that could produce power in the kilowatt range for space use. Still, RTGs alone will not power a growing lunar base. That is why people speculate that China and Russia may be working on waterless fission reactors instead. One promising direction is helium-cooled technology, often called high-temperature gas reactors. Helium does not freeze, it works at high temperatures, and it fits sealed systems that make sense for the Moon. China also operates helium-cooled reactor technology on Earth, including the HTRPM high-temperature gas-cooled design, which shows real experience with that approach. Other advanced concepts use molten materials as coolants, such as molten salt, sodium, or lead. These can handle extreme heat without high-pressure water loops, and can support compact designs. NASA's small reactor work already points toward waterless systems that can operate in vacuum-like conditions. Russia has also worked with liquid metal reactor concepts in previous programs, which could be adapted to space needs. 
So when you strip away the labels, lunar nuclear power likely falls into two main categories. RTGs provide small but ultra-long-lived power for decades. Compact fission reactors, cooled by gases like helium or by molten liquids, provide steady kilowatts through the moon's long nights and can scale with a settlement. And nuclear power is not just keeping a lunar base alive, it is also a key to reaching Mars faster. On the moon, a small reactor keeps systems running through 14 days of darkness. If you take nuclear heat and apply it to propulsion, you get nuclear thermal rockets. In a nuclear thermal engine, a reactor heats hydrogen to extreme temperatures and blasts it out of a nozzle for thrust. The payoff is efficiency. Nuclear thermal propulsion can be roughly twice as fuel efficient as chemical rockets, which can shrink travel time to Mars and reduce how long crews must live under deep space radiation. There is also nuclear electric propulsion. In that approach, reactor heat becomes electricity, and that electricity powers electric thrusters. The thrust is lower, but efficiency is very high, which can be valuable for long missions, where steady acceleration matters. After decades of slow progress, nuclear propulsion has been moving toward real demonstrations. One major effort has been DRACO, a NASA and DARPA program aimed at testing nuclear thermal propulsion in orbit. Demonstrations like this are essential because they answer the hardest questions. Can it run safely? Can it be controlled? And can it operate reliably beyond Earth? That is why the Moon Reactor story matters so much. It is not just turning on a generator in the dust. It is about who can stay active through two weeks of darkness, who can build scalable infrastructure on the Moon, and who can transform nuclear heat into the kind of propulsion that makes Mars feel closer than ever.